Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich. Thanks for watching Crime Talk. Let's get straight to the docket. First, what Netflix didn't go into in their documentary, American Killer, A Family Next Door. Second, the identity of the suspect in the Reagan-Hancock matter. Third, a Shark Tank fraudster is going to prison. Fourth, an 11-year-old showing a future as a criminal or just a youthful prank. Fifth, Breonna Taylor grand juror issues continue and Kenneth Walker speaks. Six, a Florida teacher likes her student like a boyfriend. Wait till you hear this. Seventh, a five-year-old steps up during a home invasion. And finally, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, Crime Talk aficionados. My name is Scott Reich. This is Crime Talk, the most unbiased, fact-driven, true crime channel on YouTube. Thanks for watching. First, if you haven't done so already, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and as always, leave us a comment below. Now, tonight, we go live 6 p.m. Mountain Time on both YouTube and Facebook. Please join us. First on the docket, what Netflix didn't go into in their documentary, The American Killer, A Family Next Door. Now, for those of you who don't already know, a lot of you have joined the channel recently as a result of finding new information related to that guy named Chris. We won't use his last name. Why? Because a certain family has convinced YouTube that if you use their name, that you should be completely demonetized. So, the bottom line is, if you go to our playlists, we have all kinds of information that was not discussed regarding that guy named Chris in that Netflix documentary. We have all of the audio interviews that take place while he's in custody. We have all the videos that they didn't show of the interrogation. We have the videos that show him in custody at the detention center. And most importantly, we have all of the audio related to the interviews of Nicole Kessinger. Now, listen to those. You decide whether you think there was any further involvement. Was she being completely candid or was she holding back to protect herself in some way? Now, Chris, that guy, he never, ever implicated Nicole Kessinger in any way. Certainly the police haven't charged her and we give her the presumption of innocence. But there are lots of theories out there. Now, the good thing about the internet is that everybody has a theory and everybody has an opinion, but they have to be based on facts. I've said long ago, I don't expect to ever see Nicole Kessinger charged in any way whatsoever regarding anything that that guy named Chris did, unless he implicates her directly. At this point, he has not, no indication to think that he ever will. Go to all of our playlists. You'll be happy that you did. There's more information regarding that guy named Chris than you can possibly imagine. We had it all, and we usually had it first. Next on the docket, an update regarding the identity of the suspect in the Reagan-Hancock matter. Now, as we talked about yesterday, authorities have officially released the name of the woman found dead after her unborn child was taken from her. The suspect has also been identified as a 27-year-old woman who actually knew the mother. We told you yesterday that the police found 21-year-old Reagan Simmons Hancock deceased Friday when the police were called to her residence on Austin Street in New Boston, Texas. She was eight months pregnant with a second child. Her baby, another daughter, had been removed from her body. Oklahoma authorities are holding Taylor Parker of Sims, Texas as a suspect in the kidnapping and death of the child. Police are also reporting 
that Parker arrived by ambulance at the hospital in Idabel, Oklahoma, claiming that her baby was not breathing. Unfortunately, the child passed away. Authorities have not yet commented on a motive or circumstances related to this matter, and little is known about the relationship between Hancock and Parker other than they apparently knew each other. That is a sad story. Every time you hear about a case of fetal abduction, you just simply find it hard to believe that anybody first would do that, and second, that they think that they would actually get away with it. I have never heard of a case where anyone has actually gotten away with it. So if you know of a case, please let me know. Next on the docket, a shark tank fraudster is going to prison. Now, I don't know if you like Shark Tank, but I really enjoy it. I think it's rather interesting, and you get to see how people with more money than they could possibly ever know what to do with will throw money at to see if it will go big. Well, I do recall that there was a guy that came on the show twice, and I don't think that had ever happened before, but this guy's name was Joseph Falcone and he formerly operated 3G's Vino LLC. It was a wine and liquor distributor based in Beth Page and Farmingdale, New York. Now, among other products, 3G's distributed a single serving wine in a sealed glass, which had previously been featured on an episode of Shark Tank. So between September 2014 and November of 2015, Falcone solicited investments and promised potential investors that their money would be used to fund 3Gs by purchasing the single-serving wine product, and that's all according to the prosecutors. Instead, it was alleged, and Falcone ultimately pled guilty, that he used some $527,000 of those investments for his personal benefit, including to pay off a mortgage of a Florida residence and to fund his online securities training. It was alleged that Falcone's victims were reeled in by his Shark Tank pitch, but with today's sentence where he is now going to prison, he is clearly on the hook for his crimes. Falcone pled guilty to one count of wire fraud in June of 2019, and he was ordered to pay $1.8 million in restitution to seven of his investors. Falcone, through his attorneys, wrote a sentencing memorandum where he states, quote, I took investors' money for the purpose of investing it into a startup wine business. Then I wound up commingling funds with personal funds and using some of the investors' money for my own ends. As the business grew, so did expenses, and I wound up not being able to pay all of the investors back, end quote. He apologized and accepted full responsibility. Just to be clear, the single service wine product Copa de Vino was featured on Shark Tank in season two and three, and that company is not accused of any wrongdoing whatsoever. In fact, Copa de Vino founder James Martin said in a statement that the company was not involved in any way and that Joseph Falcone did not pitch Copa de Vino on Shark Tank nor was he ever an investor in the product. The statement goes on and says, I was only the person to appear on the show on behalf of my brand. In fact, I did not engage with his company 3G Vino LLC until four years after his Shark Tank pitch. James Martin further states that I am not familiar with any details around this indictment as he was no way involved, but they were saddened to hear that he was using our Copa de Vino brand to mislead investors. His company was strictly our distributor. We severed ties with Joseph and his company in 2016. Now we have a teachable moment here. This is why you don't go around asking people for money to invest in other projects. You run a very high risk of fraud being alleged by either A, misrepresenting what you say you're gonna do with the money, or B, by failing to properly disclose what should have been disclosed, which a reasonable person might want to know. Otherwise, if they had known that, they may not have invested. That's why in most publicly traded documents or private placement memorandum, everything is disclosed about individuals past their 
past relationships, relationships in business, successes, failures. You have to lay it all out there. If you don't, it's potentially fraud. Now, in this particular case, Mr. Falcone was taking people's money for this startup. Well, you can only use it for the startup. You can't get other people's money and then use it for another project, particularly your own personal expenses. That's theft. Theft by fraud. That's bad. And guess what? Now, Mr. Falcone is going to federal prison for 24 months. So the teachable moment there is don't take other people's money for investment. Frankly, you should try to do it yourself. Otherwise, you run into serious, serious issues. Now, next on the docket, before we get going, let's take a quick recess. You have to know with whom you're dealing with when you are getting involved in uh, business relationships. What's the one way to do that? That's right, do a background search. You will not be disappointed that you did. It's very inexpensive. You can buy a package where you can search as many people as you want, or you can do one search. It's completely up to you. I think it's a better value to get the subscription where you can search anonymously as many people as you want. And in that background search, you're going to get information regarding the person's past, their history. Do they have any criminal history? Do they have bankruptcies? What kind of property do they own? Do they have any liens or judgments against them? Those are the type of things you wanna know about when you're getting into business with someone, ladies and gentlemen. Additionally, you'll get information related to phone numbers, emails, as well as social media related to these people. What if they say that they are using the money and they're the most frugal people in the world, but yet you see them floating around on big expensive yachts? Well, are they spending their money or somebody else's? Go to crimetalksearch.com, get that background subscription service, you'll be happy you did. Next on the docket, an 11 year old kid shows a bright future either as a criminal or maybe it's just a youthful prank. Well, do you remember, I guess it was back in May of this year, a five year old by the name of Adrian Zema Ripa took $3 out of his piggy bank, stole the keys to his parents' SUV in Ogden, Utah, and went on a joy ride on the freeway because he wanted to go to Los Angeles to buy a Lamborghini. While that um, act was probably not going to get a five-year-old charged, it certainly would be criminal in most jurisdictions if you were an adult. And lots of people came out so that young Adrian could get a ride and people actually took him to L.A. so that he could take a drive in a Lamborghini. Well, let's see if that happens to a young man in Louisiana. An 11-year-old who has not been identified because he is, in fact, a juvenile, led police on a nine mile chase on the north end of Baton Rouge because he stole a school bus. That's right, a school bus. The eluding in the school bus ended at about 11.30 in the morning when the school bus hit a tree. The juvenile was obviously taken into custody and does in fact face several charges, including theft of a motor vehicle, aggravated flight, three counts of aggravated damage to property and aggravated assault. The assault charge because he appeared to be purposely trying to strike a vehicle when he was eluding the police. Additionally, the police said he also flipped his middle finger at the police officers as he passed them. The young man um, took the bus, which belonged to a private owner from Progress Head Start, and it had a push to start ignition and the officers believes the boy couldn't reach the pedals, so he stood up to drive. Fortunately, the crash caused no serious damage or injuries. And the question becomes, is this young youth of America uh, going to be causing uh, more trouble in the future as an adult? Past performance can be indicative of future results, or maybe this was just a one-time aberration, joyride, that this young man will never get in trouble again. I think the bigger issue is who from Hollywood is going to come and take this guy on a bus ride? Maybe Keanu Reeves could take this young lad on a bus ride and recreate scenes from Speed where they drive around on the bus where they think there's a bomb or something if it goes below a particular speed. I'd like to see that. Next on the docket, the Breonna Taylor grand juror matter continues. Now, we have a playlist of all of the grand jury audio proceedings that have been released. 
We went straight to the source, and when the Attorney General's office released those recordings, we brought them here, and you can listen to them. What's the best way to decide if everything was on the up and up? Listen to it yourself. Don't take the word of somebody spinning the issue on the other side. Always go straight to the source. Well, those grand jury transcripts were released because the attorney general, the attorney general, Daniel Cameron, released those as a result of a grand juror coming forward and saying that they should release all of the information regarding what was presented to the grand jury. So Daniel Cameron did that. Well, now the grand juror is not satisfied because Daniel Cameron's office was arguing that, listen, the grand jury proceedings have been in place for hundreds of years. They've always been secret, and there are certain things you just can't get into. But Cameron gave information relating to all of the evidence that was presented for the grand jurors to consider. Now the mysterious grand juror wants the grand jurors' recommendations as well as the de deliberations that were recorded to be released as well. I don't think the court's going to release that particular information because that could put other grand jurors out there as a potential risk posed to them as a result of being a grand juror. And when they signed up for being that grand juror, they anticipated that they would in fact remain silent, that they would in fact remain anonymous. And so I don't see a court going that far. I think the grand juror may be given permission to speak, but that he cannot identify anyone else in the proceedings that was a grand juror. And I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, this is very rare. This is very unusual that entire grand jury proceedings are released to anyone other than the parties in the case where normally there's a protective order stating that you cannot release those to anyone who's not particularly in your office associated with a case. I think this grand juror needs to be satisfied that the information was released. I think that that is a good thing in this particular case. I think the public deserved to know that the information presented was not bogus, was not completely lopsided. Now, guess what? Grand juries are completely lopsided. The only information is that which is presented to the grand jury by the prosecutor. The defense is not in there. The reality of it is I've listened to nearly all of it, and I don't think that there's anything in there that would one that would make one believe that Daniel Cameron or his deputy state attorney generals were doing anything that was not up and up. If, if you disagree with me, let me know. But before you tell me I'm wrong, listen to the grand jury tapes. Also on the Breonna Taylor matter, Breonna Taylor's boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, went on CBS this morning and told the hosts that he was adamant that the police did not identify themselves in any way. He states that this apartment was quiet. Uh, the police were coming in between the hours of 12 and 1 a.m. and that there's no way whatsoever that he heard the police identify themselves as police. Now, it really doesn't particularly matter at this particular case. The boyfriend, Mr. Walker, was in fact charged. Those charges have since been dropped. The officers, only one is facing charges, none related to the death of Breonna Taylor. But Mr. Walker has made his statement to the public and is adamant that the police did not identify themselves. The police say they did. Ultimately, that's for a jury to decide. And in this particular case, a grand jury decided. More stuff that you just cannot believe takes place. That's right. A now former elementary school teacher was arrested for allegedly inappropriately touching her student. Now, the teacher will obviously give her the presumption of innocence. Christina Ruby Sanchez Rodriguez, who's 30 years old, was a teacher at an elementary school in Ocala, Florida. Detectives received information about the allegation when the victim reportedly recently became upset upon learning that Sanchez Rodriguez was about to be a teacher to one of the family members as well. 
The male victim told the family the suspect had been touching him on numerous occasions and didn't want the same thing to happen to someone else. The boy said that Sanchez Rodriguez told him, quote, she likes him like a boyfriend, end quote. Now, what's particularly disturbing, if this is in fact true, is that the young man was only six years old. Now, in most jurisdictions, a child is not presumed to be competent unless they are over the age of 10. It doesn't take much for someone to be found competent to testify as a witness. The court simply brings the child in, usually outside the presence of the jury or pretrial, and asks the young girl or boy um, whether they can appreciate a truth or a lie. Usually it simply says, if I was holding up a marker that was um, this color, white and black, and I said it was green, would that be a truth or a lie? And if the child said, well, that would be a lie because it's not green, it's white and black, the child is presumed competent in those proceedings. Now, of course, it is then the defense attorney's job and one of the hardest jobs ever, if this case were to proceed to trial, is to cross-examine a child. Now, I can tell you, I've had to do this. It's not pleasant, but I can tell you, when you cross-examine a five, six-year-old, seven-year-old, it's wonderful because they will tell you everything. I had a case once where not long ago, about two years ago, a child about this age was on the stand and told the jury how his mom told him to lie. It was beautiful and it came out on cross-examination and that's why cross-examination exists. We will give Miss Christina Ruby Sanchez Rodriguez the presumption of innocence. Unless she says something, this is a case where a prosecutor seriously has to look at not proceeding because of the victim's age. And I say that because oftentimes it is very traumatic for people to testify about these types of things. I doubt a six-year-old will want to get up in front of a bunch of people and talk about, for lack of a better term, his first sexual experience to a bunch of strangers. It'll be very, very difficult for him and the parents and the prosecutors will have to decide if that's truly in the best interest. I believe they'll try to seek a plea from Ms. Sanchez Rodriguez pre-trial to save the child from going through that. Next on the docket, let's talk about something positive. That's right, a five-year-old steps up during a home invasion. It's too bad a child even has to experience that, but that's the world that we live in. A South Bend, Indiana family is asking for answers after an extremely scary home invasion. The crime, which happened last Wednesday morning, was actually caught on a security camera and the video has now gone viral. What you are seeing is the mother ironing clothes, getting people started on their day. You hear the woman say, what is that? That moment is when shots were fired and four individuals in hoodies stormed into the kitchen. At least three of the suspects were holding guns at the time. The homeowner was obviously terrified and the children were there in the room. She was trying to keep her kids safe, but her son David, five, did the best to fight back. His mom states he's just her little hero and that he was trying to hit the guys. David was th David can be seen throwing toys and going after the intruders. The young boy said he was just trying to protect his mom. Well, it's too bad that a five-year-old had to experience a home invasion and shots being fired, but he sounds like a brave little boy who may go on to law enforcement. Good work, David. Next on the docket, our dumb criminal contestant of the day. Now this has happened before, different lady, but it happens apparently quite a bit. Please meet Catania Jordan. She's 46. Well, she has been arrested for domestic battery, felony domestic battery. And why did she do that? Well, that's right. 
She is now behind bars because she attacked her 69-year-old boyfriend after he refused to pleasure her orally. That's right. Both Ms. Jordan and her boyfriend were longtime residents and longtime boyfriend-girlfriend. The man told the police that he had been arguing with Jordan in reference to the defendant's smoking crack. You know, that happens all the time over the dinner table, right? Well, Jordan, the man charged, was high and began yelling at him to pleasure her orally. The victim, however, declined Jordan's request, prompting her to allegedly begin hitting and scratching him. The man, according to police reports, sustained several small lacerations, which appear to have been caused by fingernails. A witness corroborated the victim's account of the confrontation. Because when you're going to have an argument about your crack use and then wanting someone to pleasure you orally, you probably want to do that in front of a third party, right? Natural. Jordan has ultimately been charged with felony domestic battery, as well as grand theft for allegedly stealing the victim's cell phone. She's currently in custody on a $12,500 bond. Obviously, Miss Jordan is given the presumption of innocence, but Catania Jordan, you are a dumb criminal contestant of the day. Congratulations. If you, in fact, win the prize for the dumb criminal contestant of the week, that's right, you will receive a Crime Talk mug at no charge to you. And guess what? If you want Crime Talk mugs and or merchandise, simply hit the link below. Bam, you can order it just like that. It'll be there. And guess what? You don't even have to become a dumb criminal contestant, and that will make you feel smart. So order your Crime Talk merchandise today. All right. Please join us this evening, 6 p.m. Mountain Time on YouTube as well as Facebook. We'll be going live, be talking about all the events over the last couple of weeks, and hopefully some new interesting stuff as well. We can talk about the Constitution. We can talk about Amy Coney Barrett and her confirmation hearing as well. Will she be the next Supreme Court Justice to the United States? Let's talk about it. We'll see you tonight.